So hey, this morning, uh, we're continuing in week three of our series called Made for People. And, and we're beginning this series as kind of the beginning of our routine and uh, 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 habits of worshiping together on a Sunday morning by talking about the value of community and friendships as we walk with Jesus together. So week one, we talked about how Jesus, he doesn't want to be in religion with you. Jesus wants to be in relationship with you. And we talked about this loneliness epidemic that we seem to be living in and, and dwelling in and, and realizing that if we want to have lifelong friendships and really deep connections in a community of faith and, and friendships in just in general, that we need to go to Jesus first in all those things. Last week, we talked about, well, okay, we know we need to have good friends in our lives. We established that. And then last week, we talked about, like, well, how do we choose these friends wisely? Like, there are some friendships that maybe we need to end or change or some friendships we need to start because we don't have those significant friendships in our life or that our tribe of close people. And, and we really talked about how our tribe can either push us away from Jesus or our, our tribe can push us towards Jesus. And by the way, um, we've been working on getting our messages up on YouTube. Um, we're, we're still working on buying some necessary equipment that we need to uh, kind of have that functional. So if you missed any message in the past couple weeks or you want to go back and, and review it, you can go to our YouTube page, Upstate Community Church, and uh, you can review any of that information or catch up on the messages there. But today, today we're going to talk about what I think is one of the, um, the most influential topics and scriptures because today we're going to talk about when friendship hurts. How many of you have ever been hurt by a friend? Yeah, that's, that's most of us in this room. How many of you have ever had some type of hurt in your life in which it resulted in you not trusting certain people or groups of people or not being as vulnerable with others? I've been there. Right? As a pastor, there's been some relationships that I've had with people where uh, being, being a little bit too authentic or vulnerable has, has turned out to hurt me. And and what I've learned is it's not healthy to keep everything to myself. So I need to have a, a specific group of people that I meet with. And, and I do. Um, it's called my band. Now, I don't play any instruments. Um, Rob and anybody else in this room can attest to that. And I do not sing very well. I'll sing loud, but I do not sing well. Uh, but the band that I'm talking about is a band of brothers that uh, we came together and said, hey, uh, we need a space in our lives where we can share and confess our sins and talking about what's going on in our families, and praying with one another, and reading the scriptures together. So I've got a group of two other men that I meet with every Thursday night at 9 o'clock. And it's, it's changed kind of every week to week. Sometimes we meet on Wednesdays, but we always make time to make it happen. And for the past five years, we've met together every single week. And there's some awesome weeks, and there's some really, really like not awesome weeks in which we can talk about the things going on in our lives and unfortunately, a few months ago, one of our band members, one of the people that was in our band, um, just kind of stopped showing up. And he, he just didn't seem like he wanted to make time for it anymore. And we were like trying to adjust time. And, and he was going through a really rough job change. And eventually, he just kind of stopped showing up and stopped texting back. And for a group that meets every single week, for me and my other friend that were in this with him, we were, we were mad. Like, we were really hurt. In fact, this message really, I know it's for you all today. Like, you know, we, we hope that God is speaking to you through this message. I'm really preaching this message to myself uh, because there's some forgiveness that I need to give within my heart to this man who just kind of felt like he, he abandoned us in this thing that we had, like, made a commitment to do together and, and talk about our faith together. So I don't know if you've ever had an experience like that with a friend or um, maybe a, a family member or some type of relationship that you've just experienced some, um, some awful hurt and trust issues with, um, I want to let you know that Jesus has experienced the same thing. And, and that's what we're going to talk about this morning. So there's Jesus, who is the leader of these disciples in the New Testament, and, and there's this guy named Peter. And Peter is one of the most... Um, known people in the New Testament. He's probably, if, you were to name, if I were to ask every person to name the disciples of Jesus, Peter would probably be in that list of people that you would list out. Like Peter was one of the most significant disciples. And Peter was an interesting type of friend. Um, we're actually believed that, that Peter was probably one of the older members of the group. 
Um, we know that Peter was married because we know about Peter's mother-in-law, that Jesus comes and heals early in the, the Gospel of Mark. And, and Peter would be the first person to do anything for Jesus. He's the first person to speak up, even when he's not supposed to speak up about things. How many of you have ever had a friend that speaks up without thinking about what they're saying before they say it, and they get them into some trouble? Yeah, if you didn't raise your hand, maybe that's you. Maybe you're that friend this morning. Um, there's times where, where Peter will, there's a story in scripture where he jumps out of the boat to walk on water towards Jesus because he sees him out in the middle of the storm and he goes to him, but he looks down and he begins to think about what he's doing and he begins to sink. Like Jesus is one, is, one of his disciples, Peter, is just really a person that will go out and just, just do it for Jesus. But there's a story where their relationship and however close it was, completely breaks down. So we're going to be in the gospel of John this morning. We're going to start off in John 13, and we'll just skip around to John. So if you have a physical Bible with you this morning, uh, feel free to open it up. If you do not own a physical Bible, or if you own a physical Bible and it has a lot of dust on it because you can't read it, because it's in some type of translation that you just don't understand, uh, we have Bibles available for you uh, at the one place. Feel free to take them. They're for yours for the taking. Uh, you can go out there now. You can get one after service if you would like. Um, it'll also be on the screen behind us this morning. Uh, but we're going to start off in John chapter 13, where there's this prediction of what Peter is going to do to his friend Jesus. Um, so we're going to be in verse 33, verse 33 of chapter 13. And I lost my place here. So let me scroll down. There we go. Simon Peter asked, Lord, are you, where are you going? And Jesus replied, you can't go with me now, but you will follow me later. But why can't I come now, Lord, he asked. I'm ready to die for you. Jesus answered, die for me. I tell you the truth, Peter. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny three times that you even knew me. So Jesus has his disciples gathered together in this room. He's telling them, kind of similar to what we talked about the first week, same uh, chapter almost adds up. And it, just a few chapters later, we see uh, Jesus calling his disciples friends. Well, right before that, he's having this conversation that Jesus has to go somewhere. And Jesus isn't going to be there with them for, for much longer. So Peter asks, like, what, where, where are you going, Jesus. And he says, I'm going a place that you cannot go, but you will follow me later. And he's like, well, why, why can't I come now? Like, Lord, wherever you're going, I want to go. I'm willing to die for you. Like Peter was all in on Jesus. He was Jesus' top fan. He had known Jesus. He had followed Jesus. But then Jesus answers back to him and says, die for me? Seriously, die for me? I tell you the truth, Peter, before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny me three times that you ever knew me. I mean, think, think about what's going through Peter's head at this moment. You just heard your best friend in the world, the person that you followed, the person that was Lord, telling you that in just a short amount of time, you're going to deny that you even know that person. I mean, imagine your spouse coming up to you and saying, hey, in just a few hours, you're going to deny that you ever even knew me. Um, and, and maybe your spouse you know, goes to do something really weird at the mall, and you're like, who's this person with? I don't know. But that's not the type of situation that Jesus and Peter are in. Because we're going to see that Jesus is eventually taken to the cross. He's offered up by Judas, who betrays him. And he's arrested, and he's whipped, and he's preparing for the cross. And we see that Simon Peter and, and some of the other disciples are, are trying to get into this gate where this high priest is at, where the, the trial is going to happen. And they don't know the person that is in there, but one of the disciples do, and they unlock the gate for them, and they're able to go in. And as they're going in, the first denial happens. Simon Peter followed Jesus, as did, as did uh, another of the disciples. That other disciple was acquainted with the high priest, so he was allowed to enter into the high priest's courtyard with Jesus. Now, Peter had to stay outside the gate, 
But then the disciple who knew the high priest spoke to the woman that was guarding the gate, and she let Peter in. And as Peter was walking in, the woman asked Peter, you're not one of that man's disciples, are you? No, he said, I'm, I'm not. But it was a cold, and the household servants and the guards had made a charcoal fire. Now keep note of that, because the charcoal fire is going to come up again in, at, towards the end of the message. So charcoal fire, everybody keep, keep that in their heads. Remember that. Then they stood around it, warming themselves, and Peter stood with them, warning, warming himself. So he's eventually let into the gate, and they're having this bonfire because it's chilly outside, and, and they're waiting on what's going to happen in, as Jesus is talking to the high priest and being accused of, of the situation that he is in. And, and, and somebody, as he's walking in, says, hey, you're, you're not one of that man's disciples, are you? Now, Peter is afraid for his life because if he were to be identified as a follower of Jesus, he could very well end up on one of the crosses that were hung next to Jesus. That was totally in play for Peter and any of the disciples. For, so for even for Peter to go into this courtyard where this trial is about to go on, Peter's taking a substantial risk to his life. And there we see the first denial. No, I, I don't know him. Then we see the second and third denial in John 18, 25 and 27. Meanwhile... As Simon Peter was standing by the fire, warming himself, they asked him again, you're not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it. No, I'm not. But one of the household slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off. That's a whole other story. Peter cut off a guy's ear just a, a chapter earlier. And he asked, didn't I see you out there in the olive grove with Jesus? Again, Peter denied it. And immediately a rooster crows. In the Gospel of Matthew, when this story is told, it says that the rooster crows and Jesus looks from the place where he is on trial and he actually looks over to Peter at the moment that Peter does that last denial, at the moment that that rooster crows. And it also says in the Gospel of Matthew that Peter just began weeping because he had realized what he had just done. That Peter the best friend of Jesus, had denied three times, not once, but three times intentionally that he had ever even known Jesus. Because at the end of the day, Peter might have been the biggest fan of Jesus, but when it comes to dying for Jesus, he just wasn't there yet. He wasn't ready for that, like he said. And if you think about Jesus, yes, he predicted this happened, but I don't think that takes away any of the hurt that Jesus would have had in being denied by one of his best friends. Remember, he was in the close three. Peter, James, and John were the, the disciples that Jesus would constantly hang out with and be around and be in community with. When Jesus goes off to pray, he would take those three with him specifically in his intimate prayer time with God. So we see this situation where Jesus just experienced this immense amount of hurt by looking at all the people that abandon him, that betray him, that hurt him. But here's the thing, is even in the midst of the hurt that Jesus experiences, not only on the cross, but all the emotional, experience, the emotional pain that he experiences by being denied by his friends, Jesus doesn't stop the story there. We see that as the story continues, Jesus goes to the cross, he's crucified, he dies on the cross. And on the third day, he rises up from the grave. He's alive, he's resurrected, and, and he appears to his disciples in physical, bodily form. Heart beating, skin is warm, like he's there physically and, and shows himself to doubting Thomas and says, Thomas, if you're willing, like, put your hand in the holes where they pierced me up on the cross. I am here, I am alive. And all the disciples experienced that. And, and at the end of the Gospel of John, in chapter 21, which is where we're going to go next, we see that the disciples go back to their everyday jobs. They go back to the jobs that they had right before they met Jesus. They were fishermen before, and they become fishermen afterwards. And in 21, which is called the epilogue, the epilogue is kind of like that, that additional story at the end of the story. And we see the same thing that John includes that here in the Gospel of John that they're out on a boat and they're fishing and, 
And Jesus calls out, and they don't notice it's Jesus on the shore because they're kind of far out. And, and Jesus calls out, hey, try putting your nets on the other side of the boat. Apparently, they weren't very good fishermen, and Jesus knew where the fish were. But Peter, James, and John, and all the other disciples did not. So they throw the other net on the other side of the boat, and they pull up the net, and there's a load of fish in there. They can barely pull it up. It's about to sink the boat. That's how much fish that Jesus said, hey, cast your net on the other side and, and get the fish that way. Well, immediately what Peter does, because Peter likes to do things before he thinks, he says, that's the Lord. And he jumps out of the boat with his clothes. And remember, they weren't wearing clothes like this. Um, they were wearing like long robes. Imagine trying to swim in a long robe that's pretty heavy, that's kind of holding you back. So Peter runs out and he's trying to swim towards the shore and swim towards Jesus and gives Jesus the biggest sloppy, smelly fish hug that Jesus has ever gotten in his life. And Jesus begins to make them breakfast. So here we're going to see, and pay attention for the, the fire word here, as Jesus is making breakfast for Simon Peter and the disciples. After breakfast in this charcoal fire, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied. You know that I love you then feed my lambs. Jesus told him, and then Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know that I love you. Take care of my sheep. Then Jesus said a third time, uh, Jesus said and a third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Now, Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. When you were young, you were able to do as you liked, and you dressed yourself, and you went wherever you wanted to go. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hand, and others will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. Then Jesus said this to let him know by what kind of death he would glorify God. Then Jesus told him, follow me. So as Jesus is making breakfast, the other disciples are sitting around and, and Peter's there. And, and can you imagine, you can probably cut the tension for Peter with a knife in this situation. Because Peter and Jesus, they haven't talked about the whole denial thing. They haven't addressed that. So Jesus is sitting there with Peter. Peter knows that he has denied his best friend three times. And there's some hurt and some lack of trust that is there. So Jesus asks the question that is the elephant in the room. He says, Simon, son of John, and remember, that's a name that he had before he became Peter. Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he kind of shakes it off. He's like, oh, yes, Lord, of course you know that I love you. Like, like you know that? Of course you know that I love you. And he continues cooking the fish. He flips, flips the fish over and asks the question again. Hey, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And then Peter goes again, yeah, of course. Of course you know that I love you. Yes, Jesus, of course I love you. And then a third time, he says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And then Peter, he, he's just kind of like at the end of his rope here. He's like, I, I don't know what else to tell you, Jesus. You know everything. Of course you know that I love you. And he says, feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. How many times did Peter deny Jesus? Three. How many times did Jesus ask if Simon, son of John, do you love me? Three. What Jesus does here is takes the hurt and the pain that he experienced with his best friend and he enters into relationship by redeeming him, restoring him, and not only that, he puts him into a place of command to say, go out, be my disciple, and feed my sheep. And Peter, if you don't know, he goes to Rome and he starts the church in Rome. And in the Catholic tradition, he's actually listed as the very first pope of the Catholic church, spanning all the way back to Peter. That's how influential Peter was because Jesus chose to forgive and redeem his friend. Jesus wants to redeem our relationships. He wanted to redeem 
the relationship with Peter and, and he wants to redeem his relationship with you and, and your relationships with some friends or family members that you've experienced great pain and hurt from in some shape or form. Now, full disclosure here. There are some relationships that are just done, that are just severed forever. And, and there are some hurts. Now, forgiveness can enter into the picture, but I'm not saying that for every type of relationship that has broken trust that you should run back to those relationships. That is not what I'm saying. But I think there are a lot of friendships and relationships where there's been these teeny tiny hurts and, and this relationship that I talked about with my friend that was in our, our, our band. Like, that's a situation where I need to forgive and give him grace and probably reach out and say, hey man, I'm thinking about you, praying for you. I just want to let you know, like I've been holding this against you and I need to just let go of this. I, I think there's a lot of friendships that we have that we just need to send that text or make that phone call so that we can allow Jesus to do his work of grace and forgiveness in us because that's what he does with Peter. And the thing is, in, in most of even our really good relationships, we've got to find ways to offer grace and forgiveness because when we hit that point of something happening, because guess what? You're friends with people and people are messy and they're sinful and they mess up all the time. And eventually, as long as you're going to be in friendship with someone, they're going to hurt you. And it might be a small hurt. It might be a big hurt. But being able to not just stop the friendship at that point, but to continue with that and work through the mess and the sloppiness and the hurt and the trust, we can develop some really deep relationships with people. I'm convinced that Peter wouldn't be the leader in the church or the person that was sold out for Jesus like he was if there wouldn't been this redemption that Jesus had done for Peter. Who does Jesus need to redeem in your life? Who, who in your relationship do you need to offer this grace and forgiveness? Because friendship that lasts, it requires that. Friendships that last require grace and forgiveness. Jesus wants to come in and redeem the relationships that have once been broken and put them back together, or at least put them in a situation where you don't have to carry around that grief and pain and regret anymore. By offering that grace and forgiveness, at the very least, you get to be freed from what you have been carrying around that you were not designed to carry around. Friendship that lasts requires grace and forgiveness. The trust issues that you have with someone or the, the, the friendship or the family dynamic that you used to have that you wish you could get back to, it, it might be possible for you but it requires a conversation. And first, it requires a conversation with Jesus to say, Jesus, I can't control the outcome of me reaching out to this person and giving them forgiveness. But I know, Jesus, that, that you can do above what we can ask for or imagine. So Jesus, would you just redeem this relationship or do something within, within my heart, even when I can't control it, to just be able to reach out? Because Jesus wants you to forgive. He wants you to offer grace because he is the God that has forgiven you. In the book of Ephesians, Paul writes this to the church in Ephesus because they were dealing with some of this stuff too. Um, even with people within their own community, they're, they're gathering their church. So this is what he says in chapter four to the church in Ephesus. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. We live in a culture that um, likes to not forget and not forgive. Now, Jesus may not be calling you to forget everything that's happened, but he may be calling you to forgive, to get rid of all that rage and bitterness and anger because it's not good for you anyway. It's not how God designed you to live and to carry on relationships. To get rid of all those things, to be tenderhearted, to be kind to one another, to forgive one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. And he has forgiven you. You are forgiven by the blood of the Lamb. And he desperately wants that for you and your relationships with others. 
He wants you to have relationships that are whole and full of grace and forgiveness and that walk with Jesus every step of the way. So here's how I want to end today with this question is who do you need to forgive? What's a friend in your life that you need to forgive? Think of a name, think of a family member, think of a person that um, you've been holding some angst against or unforgiveness or when you think of their name, you get bitter and angry. Like, who is that person in your life that you need to forgive? And here's a second question for you, because I think um, a lot of times we feel like we can't enter into a relationship with Jesus because we feel like we're too far gone. Like, there, there's been things that we've done in our lives, sins that we've committed or relationships that we've been in or things that we've done or thought that there's no way that God could love us because we think those things or do those things. And, and that's just not true. So maybe, how does God have to redeem you today? Does God need to do some work of redemption and forgiveness in your heart, in your mind, in your body? Like, what does God need to do in you? If, if you can't think of a name of a friend who needs forgiveness, maybe you're the one that needs the forgiveness this morning. Because Jesus designed us to be made for people and even go through the messiness of being in relationship with people. That's why grace is one of our core values here at Upstate Community. Because we realize we're not going to be a perfect church. We're going to mess up. Our people are going to mess up. And we've got to learn how to walk through the messiness of that. Because that's what Jesus calls us to do. The people of Jesus need to be people that are able to give grace and to forgive because we've been forgiven from our sins and our shortcomings and all the stuff that we mess up on so that we can serve a holy God. So who do you need to forgive this morning? As Rob comes back up, we're going to spend just a little bit of time in prayer and reflecting on, on this question. Who do you need to forgive or do you need to be forgiven? Do you need to accept the forgiveness that Jesus has offered you? Let's bow our heads. Let's pray.